Good morning. It's May the 10th, 2020. It's Mother's Day. Always a nice day to pass out flowers to moms at church, and unfortunately we can't do that. But I can still tell you my favorite Mother's Day story. Real quick. A little girl was standing up to give her peace at church one Sunday. And she forgot the words when she saw the crowd suddenly stage fright hit. Her mother was sitting on the front row. And so she tried to mouth the words to her daughter. And the little girl goes, no, I didn't hear it. I am the light of the world, her mother said. No, I'm suddenly, I am the light of the world. And the little girl goes, my mother is the light of the world. You know what, moms? You are. I've always said, you moms, show us what it means to practice unconditional love. No matter what we do, you forgive us and we move on. Thank you. You come closer to showing us the real light of the world than anyone. Have a great day. The scripture for this morning that I want to read is from the 14th chapter of John's Gospel. Words that you've heard many times when you've attended funerals. But this morning, it is in our lectionary to be read for this day, this fifth Sunday of Eastertide. Hear these words from John 14. Do not, lay, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house, <clears throat> there are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you? But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way to the place where I'm going, Jesus said. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. This is the reading of the word. I live in a mansion. Oh, not by the standards of the United States of America. I don't live in a mansion. But by the majority of the people of the world, I live in a mansion. And so also do you. We live in the upper percentage of the world's wealth. And our homes show it. We have lovely homes. We have nice homes. We have great abiding places. Last Monday, Charlotte and I were locked out of our house. The house that 75% of the world would say is a mansion. Locked out. Not just locked down, not just stay home, stay safe, locked out. A storm blew through our neighborhood Monday morning. And for just one long 48-hour day, it seemed like, we, Charlotte and I, were like homeless. Our very comfortable, abiding place that we call home was locked up and we couldn't get in. We were not really homeless. It just felt that way. We had a home. It's just that there was no way to get in it. Let me explain. I woke up last Monday morning with plans for the day, as I most do, usually do most every day. Quite normal. I took my shower and <clears throat> proceeded to get at my schedule, which included for me that day going to the hardware store to pick up a couple of little items to complete a backyard project. It would start my early morning and Layla, our beloved boxer, was in the back seat, my beloved homemade mask in place. I went to the hardware store to acquire a couple of things that I needed. And I was wearing a mask practicing social distancing as we went. Monday morning, Charlotte had a couple of things to pick up at the grocery store, and so she did her early morning shopping. I was the last to leave the house. 
Now, for those of you who live in Shawnee County, you may remember that the skies turned an eerie black Monday morning at about nine o'clock. It got so dark, it was evident a storm was brewing. But storms have never bothered me all that much, so I took off on my trek to the store. Well, the storm that was moving in had significantly more severity to it than I was anticipating. In fact, in just a few short minutes, while we were both gone from our neighborhood, a fierce wind blew through and actually toppled four utility poles. They snapped off halfway on the pole and there were power lines on the ground. I didn't know it, of course, but there was no power when we got home. I was oblivious to what had happened. When I came home from the hardware store, I came in the driveway, pushed the magic button on my rearview mirror that is programmed to lift the garage door by electricity. And of course, the garage door didn't go up. I'll spare you the details. But just let it be known, I got drenched trying to get that door open, then going around and checking three other places where I might be able to get in. And our house was locked up like Fort Knox. All doors and storm doors, which had no key opening to them at all, were locked. They were locked out. But I didn't despair. You know, usually power outages don't last that long. And I called and reported the outage to the energy company. They said they'd have it back on in 30 minutes. Eh, it's not long to wait. I had the newspaper at my side. So I read the newspaper and waited for the electricity to come back on. Well, it didn't come back on in 30 minutes. We were soon to discover that the electric company was also oblivious to the severity of the storm that had blown through our neighborhood. The power didn't restore in 30 minutes. And ultimately, after discovering what had happened, I was driving through the neighborhood and saw one of the utility workers and asked him how long he thought it was going to take. He said, it'll be late tonight. Maybe tomorrow morning when you get up, you'll have power. Maybe, he said. And did I tell you we were locked out of the house? <laughs> well, I finally did secure a locksmith at about 7 o'clock that evening who figured out a way to get us back in our dark house. Went into the living room, sat down in my easy chair, my, my recliner, reached around to push the button for it to go, the foot to go. Oh, the chair is also electric. I said, let's go to bed. It's dark, not much of a way to relax. Let's just go to bed. It was nine o'clock. You know, some interesting thoughts came to my mind on Monday and on the days since having been locked out of our house. This week's scripture gospel lectionary reading was going through my mind. That's the first thing I do every Monday morning is get up and read the scripture. The lectionary reading for the next Sunday morning. Every day, I've been hearing those words go back and forth in my head. It was... As I said earlier, words of Jesus at the last Passover meal, they were eating together the night before he was to go to the cross. And at the table that night, Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Good news. But what good is a mansion if you're locked out? What good is a mansion if you don't know the way to get in? Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, that would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And where I am, there you may be also. Wonderful news. Great promise of the resurrection. Great news for the disciples. But they're asking themselves, how can we claim it? We don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? The way. Well, as I said, <clears throat> we hear this passage quite often at funerals. It does speak of the resurrection promise. A promise that Jesus spoke of that was not just his resurrection promise, but it was a promise for each of those disciples. 
and for you and for me as well. Good news, this line from John 14, that that line out of the gospel was taken even has taken on even new meaning for me during this past week in light of what we've experienced being locked out of our dwelling place. Since we found ourselves in lockout last week, I've had more time to think about homeless people, over half a million in our country, people without homes, over 500 in the state of Kansas without homes, and too many of those are right in our home counties, Shawnee. Most of them, if they have any vision of a mansion, most of them have no idea of the way, how to get in, how to get out of their condition their situation. I thought a lot about that, Monday and since. I drove around the neighborhood last Monday. I noted several homes that had been destroyed, or not destroyed, but damaged. We didn't have any damage done to our house except the power outage. But there were quite a few that had big limbs, clear down on the roofs of the house. And there were limbs, huge limbs, trees in the street significant damage. I thought of the power of the wind. Someone said it lasted for only 30 to 45 seconds in our neighborhood. And if I witnessed those workers hard at work in the neighborhood, coupled with all the utility workers so dedicated to trying to get us fixed up, my mind contemplated the communities that have experienced severe tornadic winds and an earthquake like touched in Puerto Rico recently. And so I've said a prayer of thanksgiving for a week of compassion, a prayer of thanksgiving for one great hour of sharing. Our church's special day offerings that we take each year to especially meet the needs of those who have experienced natural disasters in their homes. Those who have lost their homes and all of the comforts and treasures that go with them. In light of my experience this past week, I've considered how many things in daily life I take for granted. You know, it's not a bad idea to be occasionally inconvenienced, just so we stop to give thanks for our conveniences. How many times this week I've said, thank you for power, thank you for electricity, something I hadn't remembered to be thankful for in days before last week. Charlotte and I are fortunate to have a really nice home, a place that gives us shelter over our heads and plenty of protection from all of the elements of the world. My home, at your home, most any home of any middle-class family in the United States today, our homes would be considered mansions, not by just a few in the world, but by most of the people in the world. And I've spent very, little amount of time in third world countries, but I have been to work camps in Honduras and I have been in Jamaica, not very long, but long enough to understand what the late William Sloan Coffin referred to as third world eyes. And I'm always brought back to this quotation from an unknown source, one that I've used with some frequency but it came to me this past week as I reflected on our having been locked out of home. Consider this. If you have food in your refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the world. Might we just be grateful for what we have? Count our blessings rather than our inconveniences. So, what became a minor inconvenience to me last Monday is actually a way of life for more than half of the world. But the questions continued to plague me in the midst of inconvenience. What good is a mansion if you don't know the way to get in it? Good question. The disciples had good questions. You see, Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure. Departure from earth that night at the table. 
He was going home. He knew that. He knew he was going to his father's house. He also knew that one day his disciples would. That he knew that they were going to be grief-stricken and perplexed at his departure. He wanted those closest to him to understand that he was going home. The doors would be unlocked. There would be no power failure. He'll be safe and sound. It's going to be okay. And Jesus was saying, not only am I going to be safe and sound and okay, I'm also going to prepare a place for you to unlock the doors to my father's mansion, to make it possible for you and for you and for you and for you to come in. That's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? The resurrection promise, not just reserved for Jesus, but for each of us who can accept his grace, even in the midst of our inconveniences. Jesus went on <clears throat> with his conversation with his disciples that night. He said, and you know the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way. You know what? I understand, Thomas. When you don't know the way to unlock the doors, it's pretty frustrating. It's perplexing, fearsome. And what good is a mansion if you don't know the way to get in? Check out, though, how Jesus answered the question. Thomas, he said, I am the way. Think about that for a minute. Think about that tiny three-letter word, way. Jesus said, I am the way. I think what he's saying is this. Jesus is more than just a belief. Receiving the promise to the mansion requires more than just believing in Jesus. Jesus is more than systematic theology like I learned in seminary, more than dogma, more than a system of beliefs, more than just a proclamation that Jesus is Lord. Jesus once said, not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Those who understand and accept that Jesus' radical call to love without abandon, to forgive without reservation, to reach out to the least of these without qualification, like your mother, that's the Jesus way. Well, the earliest Christians we referred to, uh, the earliest Christians were referred to as people of the way. And that's what I'm calling you to today. People who understand that Jesus is a way of life, more than just a belief, but a way. We too are called not to just be believers, the people of the way. Oh, how happy we were to see the door open again in our home last Monday evening. It was a short-lived homelessness. It was a minor inconvenience, but it was good for me. I needed that, to be locked out for a short while, because it made me realize and remember and I hope it makes you realize as well what an awesome gift we have waiting for us. And the way to the open door is Jesus.